Wrecked, DNF, Vex and Mayhem, kind of a thing. Apex and Camber, that's Ooh. another one. So okay. that's the one I fought for, but it was considered too big brained, I guess. Hi, Flova Voice here, co creator of the comic book First Place Losers. You can find us over at Kickstarter or myself personally at flobito.com. And you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening. We're in Two Geeks Talking, is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a multi talented individual. He's a comedian. He's a baseball journalist. He's, of course, a co-creator of an amazing new comic series. It's basically mechs and mayhem, and that's the two genres I love the best. It's called First Place Losers. We are joined by the ever-talented Lobo Boys. How are you doing today? Wow, wow. That intro was great. I mean, goodbye, everybody. I can't top that. That's... <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks so much for having me on your, your show. I've been I've been listening and, and watching some episodes back to back to back, getting myself in the mood for this one. And uh, I got some big shoes to fill. We're going to have a good time. <laughs> well, you've already flattered me enough. You know, I'm just going to stop there and I'll just let you talk for the next hour. There you go. That works so well for me. <laughs> I love a person that is in the entertainment industry as much as you are. Because, you know, being a comedian, that's got to be difficult. Being a baseball journalist, of course, you know, we're all biased in our own opinions. You know, go Tigers. And of course being a comic creator. I, I love the fact that you're in so many different areas. I'm getting excited talking about you here, but I want to know, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, who are you and what are you bringing to Two Geeks Talking today? Wow. Uh, that is a very deep question. Thank you for <laughs> asking me that. I, we know of all the creative endeavors I'm, I'm involved with or responsible for, I consider myself a writer first, right? I write the jokes when I do my stand up. I write some of the stuff for the those baseball articles. Shout out to the Black Baseball Mixtape, which I'm a contributor for. Let's go Mets. Uh, I am a writer when it comes to uh, all the other aspects as well. And I even write my scripts when I perform uh, as a master of ceremony. So I always say that first, but I know I live in a, a town. I live in Los Angeles currently where everyone collects slashes. So you got to say, hey, I'm a writer slash performer slash comedian slash belly dancer. Uh, that part's not true. Be, be <laughs> Get the idea so i understand that part but i always say what's the best way to convey the idea i want and as efficiently as possible and i worked from there uh, no I, I love that i think that's that's great um we always wear so many different hats and we always want to entertain the masses as much as we do i mean being a podcaster yourself as well you obviously have to entertain a wide variety of people here you know looking at first place losers i called it mechs and mayhem only because that that was what really kind of came to mind when i was looking at the images when i was looking at your kickstarter campaign and things like that i i love those two genres only because it just brings me back to a time of like robotech and mech warrior and things like that that i just i grew up with in the, in the 80s and 90s so what is it about first place losers that inspired you to co-create this series oh yeah that is kind of the stuff we're going for the 90s cartoon things but uh going back it, well i can't believe i'm gonna say shots of the pandemic but but the, the pandemic really was a creative reset for a lot of people i like to consider it like a, like a race that has a, a safety car and so everyone had to slow down and reassess some people gained positions some people lost positions my co-writer uh, andrew maxwell and i we fell in love with the netflix series drive to survive which is about formula one uh they try to really personify the drivers and make them characters i know a lot of motorsport fans don't like the show or are they very polarized about the show being such a reality show and reality shows aren't really that factual anymore but we loved everything about it uh, andrew liked the the characters uh, the ricardos the hamiltons the team aspect of it and for me uh, as an 80s kid well i was born in the 80s but i was a 90s kid myself i love the global pageantry you know of, of going from city to city country to country very street fighter too you know you get in a little plane you fly out and you you beat up guile or e honda or whatever and so we originally want to have an F1 book or a motor open wheel motorsport book. Uh, but then we realized that even though I'm more of a car guy than Andrew were, we weren't car guys to the point to get that right. And so it was like, well, how do we translate this idea of like the, the man and machine uh, and the idea of racing and for points and what it means to people and how it could be a moment of inches with something that is more intricate than a car, but not a car. So someone would say, wait a minute, the differential's off in this one, you know? And so we really went to to the idea of mechs and Andrew's a way mech guy. He's a Gundam collector. And he's like, let's try this. And I was like, it will never work. And so that's what you know when, when you have a good idea, when you can go, I like the idea, it won't work. And your brain says, you don't get to sleep until you make that work. I think that's that's the one thing that be, between the imposter syndrome and the self-doubt that we all have as creative people, the fact that 
ourselves or other people telling us it just won't work or you can't do that it should be a driving force should be the wait a second no i might actually have something i'm glad you guys you guys came together to realize that no we can actually do this and i don't think a lot of people take that first step absolutely you know that scene in avengers where like where um the hulk is like i'm always angry uh i think once i reconcile doubt will always be there I always say it's uh, it's our creative body odor. Like you can take a shower, but you can't get rid of it forever. Uh, once it's there, you just kind of go, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be doubtful, but it's going to be done. And then you can always take it and build on that. See, that's me and garlic though. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you love it, but you hate it. Yeah. Exactly. Back away. I had garlic. <laughs> I'm a creative person. Back away. Stay, stay 10 feet away. Looking at the fact that you have a multitude of characters, the lower third, we have currently for those that are watching this doesn't do your menagerie characters justice they are so different so colorful so amazing who is the main cast of characters for first place losers because i didn't know who to pick because everything just looked amazing so oh thank first of all thank you so much and it really was uh, max davenport our, our lead artist there i mean he really made every team and every mech give a, a personality of its own so this was the balance of, of of plotting seeds for a world but not giving too much and so it does seem a little bit overwhelming at first because you want to be able to tell a story later on but the main core story is about bear uh jaco jung who is a, a former racer that was locked up uh for things that happened in the past he was released by underachieving racing team to be the principal or the racing principal for an upstart team that's currently in last place and so uh jacko is kind of the in ear to d which is our main driver character and she's a bit of a spitfire so there's already that dynamic out of the gate but you can pick and choose you can say is it going to be bear's redemption is it d's going to be the good for the season why would a team spring someone out of prison <laughs> who's really on top of the table there's a lot of things to pull off of World building, I think, is, is rather interesting because unless you really take the time to build the world of your comic, if it's a one shot or if it's an entire series, I think that really strives to your own creativity and what your conscious and subconscious can pull from in order to build the world that you created. What is it that drives you to build the world of First Place Losers and how did you get to that point? Yeah, that's thank you so much for asking that question. I've been on a lot of shows for for the book, and no one ever asked that question specifically. So I, I, I it sounds like I'm being like you know like flurry, but I really, I really appreciate that. So, so there's always a balance when it comes to establishing what you want to say, what seeds you want to plant, because if you don't do enough of it, it seems very wooden, like everyone's just acting on a blank backdrop. But if it's too much, it becomes a homework assignment. You know what I mean? Like a, a, those giant young adult novels where it has so much preamble, you're like, oh, okay, I'm over it like let's get into the, the show so there really was a fine balance i think most people of a certain age can go back to say the john wick series right where the first movie you knew that he used to have a very nefarious job he tried to retire but as it went on there was like oh there's hotels and there's rules and there's contracts and there's a whole different slang you know dinner party of eight or something like that and so that was kind of what i appreciated the most of it like i said it was a pageantry of going from city to city like like in sports which i loved so each location needed to have its own backstory and i go well if i'm going to go the trouble of flying out to this planet because it's it's an interplanetary book. It takes place out in space. Uh, what kind of person or individuals would do that? And then we had character sheets. And so Andrew and I had pages and pages of character drafts of who we would use and who we wouldn't. So it became like picking toys out of a box as opposed to being like, ah, oh, the story's about D and Bear. It was, hey, of our characters, I think this one is speaking to us. Uh, I was a big fan of Dora Alves, which you'll meet also in the book. She is an also another racer, racer on the book. So that was kind of like my personal, like, yes, I'm rooting for Dora. Uh, and then trying to see what works, what doesn't work, what add on for later, what you want to take off, which ones get in the way of story. You don't want elements to get in the way of the story. Uh, and so it was kind of like a, a trial and error on my end. But if you could see our Google Drive of what we have, I mean, we have fashions of the fan base. We have team colors already, palettes already done. We have character drafts and sheets. We have fake sponsors. I mean, it really was a process. But the reason why we do all that, if someone comes to me and goes, I want a graphic novel based on that character. We do. It is not a problem. You have all everything already built. And so you can really much just focus on that particular story. Let's talk about the team itself. You mentioned their names already, but who is the team besides yourself that have created this or co-created this entire particular series? We got to give props where props are due, right? <laughs> no, please. All, all the props, all the props, you know. Uh, Andrew Maxwell is the main creative force of this. He was a comic book writer and and and. and 
for a long time, produced for a long time under his Grenade Fight banner. Uh, we met at the Comic Con a couple of years ago. I thought he was a lot further along than I was. I had my own struggles as a writer uh, because I didn't find the right artist. And so Andrew's like, that's what I'm good at. And so Andrew's a great writer. He was the main dialogue drafter here. And he found Max Davenport uh, from Titanfall series. And those were the core three. So many different uh, X chains. Now they're called X Twitter uh, Twitter chains. <laughs> I always forget what name it is now. Uh, it was just the core three of us going back and forth. But I uh, give a shout out to Ed, who was our letterer, and Andre, who helped us with some of the sponsor logos and such. So I think there's like six of us in total, but the core three were Andrew, Max, and myself. This is always interesting, especially in a collaborative effort, because you're all coming towards a singular point, a singular idea, a singular series. When you started working together, what was the first piece of artwork you got back that was way better than what was on the script? I I am so jaded from art, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Okay, so some so backstories. So I, I was kind of a creator myself. I did a superhero book called Silver Streak, and and after that, I did a graphic novel called Legacy, which is like a Indiana Jones, like a national treasure thing. And uh, the story goes, I tell the story a lot, is that it got rejected from comic book sites because the art wasn't good. It was just, as all I could afford, art's expensive. Uh, and so it was kind of like, like, I paid a lot of money, but then I couldn't sell the book because it couldn't be featured anywhere. I was using a font uh, or typeface that was very similar to Comic Sans. And we all love Comic Sans. So I, I, I feel sorry for Andrew. And I do feel sorry because Max did phenomenal work on a technical level. But I had, was just so burned of what was considered good or not. I was like, Andrew, is this good? I, I don't know. I don't know. If it's good. He's like, what do you mean? It's phenomenal. I'm like, okay. Because I just I just had this vision of the negative feelings of being beat down again saying, sorry, kid, not good enough. But uh, but I would say that double page spread, which is what this uh, the graphic here is a clip of, uh, is when I go, oh, man, this is scale. This is something I can see this being in a kid's poster five, ten years from now when the movie comes out. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know what I mean? Uh, so that was the first time I was personally thinking. But I really felt bad for both Max because Max, Max was like working double time to get this done. And Andrew's like, man, this is great, right? And I go, it's satisfactory. And he's like, oh, Flobo, what are you, a robot? <laughs> but it's got to be tough, though, because being an independent creator, there's always that moniker of, well, indie comics is just amateur out. And I know from doing this for 15, 16 years, interviewing 1,200 plus people in the comic industry, that it is, it is just... There's so many talented people and so many talented individuals that I just hope this show can give it a, a little bit of a platform for those that come on, like yourselves. Why is it, do you think, that the indie comic scene is way better than people who don't follow comics may not realize? Well, I think the the unfortunate thing is there is a lot of stuff that is not good in indie comics. There's a lot of stuff that's not good in in, in the ebook series, or a lot of things that's not good in the TikTok creator series. That stuff exists. The problem is it doesn't become a stereotype. And a lot of times we feel as creatives that one, there's a part of us that we have to like create to improve. So our first book won't be as good as our second. But there's a lot of us going land. I'm just like shooting off flares in the middle of the ocean. Can anyone see me? And I think that's what becomes difficult because I didn't really know there was a deep network of comic book creators that only not only want to be a part of this project, but are willing to help promote the project, which is like worth his weight in gold of having someone go, hey, I'm on this thing. Check it out. As opposed to, hey, thanks for your money. Peace. Right. I'm just a hired guy. And I think that there is a community there that wants to see the art form be considered legitimate or more legitimate than it is. I won't say it's not legitimate, but more legitimate than what it is. And I think once we tap into that, it's a lot better. So yes, there is a lot of stuff that's mass produced. I won't use the the, the nefarious two letters everyone hates when it comes to comics. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do think if you find those individuals that believe in your project, they do a lot of the heavy lifting that a social media ad can't do. The creative process is always interesting. Actually, naming conventions is rather interesting. It's from a film background that you have, obviously, when it comes to script formatting, every character should have a name and there should never be a man one, woman one or whatever. Yes. This is wrong. This is fundamentally wrong. What are you yeah. doing? You're killing me inside, literally. <laughs> <laughs> looking at first place losers, looking at your naming conventions of your particular characters, what was the name that you kind of bounced around with everyone that changed a couple of times and you finally settled on something that everyone agreed on? 
Oh, the the mechs themselves. And I always, this is why I, if anyone ever asked me on a podcast, I go, what are they called again? Because we tried everything. Like, are they mechs? Does the word mech exist? Are they robots or mm -hmm. robots? Shout out to the Futurama. Uh, I think we settled on the exo rigs, but it was trying to figure out the right balance of, you want to make sure it sounds like something that's sporty because this is an athletic competition, but nothing that's too like on the nose or too futuristic or not, nothing too esoteric, like whisper in the wind machine or anything <laughs> like that but i think that went the, the most number of drafts but i would say also the name the conventions of like the names of characters or do we do symbols do we do alien names do we try to do things that are hard to pronounce do we do other languages and we kind of float around with that one of the team is named Atmos, which is actually a greek for for wind and we got to play around with that kind of language but you didn't want to put it so distracting to the point where people are going, okay, all right, Harvard, calm down. You're just putting words together. And also there's, you don't want to run the risk of not sounding like you're from that time either. If everyone was named Joe and Mary, you would go, well, this could be, you know, <laughs> on the street of Des Moines in 1955 or something <laughs> like that. So there is a bit of a balance there, but definitely the exo rig was the one that we, we argued and the title. I mean, we mm -hmm. had 35 titles uh, until we settled on first place losers that out to Max Davenport, the artist for, for, for confirmation that for us but uh but yeah those are the two big ones all right what, what were some of the other titles that were that were close to being like the uh the series yeah uh wrecked dnf uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Mayhem kind of a thing. Uh, Apex and Camber. That's Ooh, another one. So okay. that's the one I fought for, but it was considered too big brained, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but, but first place losers kind of lends itself to the chaotic nature of mm. what we're looking for and kind of opens the door for us to flirt with humor. Obviously we're not a comedy book, but if you wanted to have those kind of moments, we can as well. Well, you can't, you can't go hardcore into like, you know, the, the tech aspect of a particular series. You need that type of levity or sadness, depending on which side you're going on, whatever the, however the series is going. Is this a long running series or is this a one shot? I'm, I'm curious about that. Yeah. So this particular arc is set for about four or five issues, nice. you know, Kickstarter permitting. <laughs> you, you know how that goes. The guys uh, got, Kickstarter, you know, whatever. Right. Gonna wrap this up right now. <laughs> we only got 12 pages. Uh, so, so the idea is that we're going to have different stories and arcs into this one. Like if I had another opportunity, I would love to do a, a spinoff or concurrent series featuring other teams uh, as almost like another story in this world or a sequel story. Uh, but yeah, definitely as it is right now, kind of a mini series. I think something that writers don't do these days is they're so focused on the main character that it becomes a Mary Sue type character, whether they want to or not, where the character mm -hmm. always has to survive, always has to, always has to win, basically. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of series don't take the time to write from every character's perspective if, say, there's a core group of characters. And I think that lends itself to the style of almost anime in a sense of if you get a series where you have every character has their own point of view, and you could weave between those characters seamlessly, yeah. you have a you basically have the recipe for success. I agree. And I think that's a a bigger problem with entertainment in general. Like, I'm not sure if you want to be cynical and be like, oh, it's because of merchandise sales or, or what have you. But I remember as a kid in the 80s and 90s, a movie would come out and I, you would walk out of the theater. Remember theaters? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you would walk out of a theater be like, oh, I'm this guy. No, I'm this guy. Oh, you're totally this guy. And this felt now more and ever. It's like, okay, I'm Tom Cruise. And that's it. Like, that's all the option you got. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I'm Matt Damon or mm -hmm. I'm Jason Bourne. That's all you got. So I didn't think that trickles down. But a lot of times when we create for the first time, we try to think about what's missing instead of saying here's a story that i think it's cool we say oh man no one said a story no one's heard this story before so i'm gonna show, tell you as directly as possible and you get those one track main character quests where side quest characters goes you can do it no you can't i love you i hate you while this person's on this path but life isn't like that life has never been a line it's at the best a zigzag or at worst a, a disco roundabout in the middle of things and so i think it's a lot of fun because you want to have some surprises along the way so you get to go back and say oh wow that guy was in the first issue drinking a smoothie that means <laughs> and make it kind of a living breathing world oh the check off check off smoothie there you go that, yes uh, it. <laughs> a smoothie in act one must be drank by actor <laughs> It's funny. I actually met the character Chekhov at a comic convention. He was in, we were in the same hotel and he was in the elevator with me. Uh, he was actually behind me when I was checking in yeah. and then he got into the same elevator and I turned to him, I go, love your work. Uh, but I'm not following you. You're following me. And he kind of chuckled. Oh, <laughs> nice. anyway. The original Chekhov? Yeah. The original Chekhov. Yeah. Oh, wow. Walter, uh, 
Uh, Coney, uh, what message do you hope readers will take away from First Place Losers once they get to read the, the first issue? That is interesting because I think there's multiple messages here. I mean, one that, you know, we can, you can do it. I think a lot of times with, with the way creative aspects are, uh, a lot of my creative friends are being like, oh man, it's a cool idea, but you'll never get it done. The fact that we have the money raised and we're going to print, that's pretty cool. But from a story standpoint, really about the idea of what it takes to be pulled back into something you care about mm. to help defend something you love as well. So Bear goes back into something he liked or appreciated in racing, but at the same time, he's still dealing with the, the fall of last time and what it's done to his family. And, and D is, is someone on a team that is really dedicated to this craft as well, but she has her own desires to win, her own desires to succeed in her own ways. And so I think that's really cool how I always tell people, never devote yourself to your job you devote yourself to your work and i think both these characters are kind of doing that in that first issue the fact that you're in the entertainment industry in multiple different areas here being a comedian baseball journalist and podcaster what one thing have you taken from each of those professions to become the writer that you are yeah uh don't be a jerk and uh, that's <laughs> Yeah, you know, when it comes to networking with people and collaborating, sure, right? There's talent and there's talent everywhere. So there used to be a time where it was like, well, I mean, I don't really like him, but he's connected and that that's gone with the internet and all that stuff. But but either underneath that, like we talk about humanity, we talked about dreams and stuff like that. Fictional characters have that too, because like you, I can never create a character that has man one. You know what I'm saying? Like man one and, and woman one not have baby two. It doesn't make sense to me. So when you create a name and a backstory uh then you say what needs want drives and desires there was a character that unfortunately didn't make the cut in the mm -hmm. first draft uh the first issue i'm kind of mad about it but it's fine because <laughs> i created it from scratch his name was reggie wax and that was kind of like the the mary sue that was kind of like my thing but like the idea of his whole drive was here is somebody that was that was a victim of the kindness for weakness, always too kind for his own good, always took a, a less performing extra rig, always took a second place offer because he was trying to be the guy that's all about favors or all about doing the right thing. And I wanted to play up that, what it means if you do that too much in the extreme. Sometimes you have to look out for number one, sure. Sometimes you have to you know, fight back or, or talk someone down when you feel disrespected. But I think as in real life or in creative works, as long as you have that little nugget of humanity, that you're a person you know, that has feelings and dreams and desires and you're on easy street, man. I mean, you could be in the book too, baby. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> and Kurt Sasso for the win. He's not even registered. He's like, Zoom, he's by. I'm Big the announcer and I just have my own exo rig, you know, there you go. Uh, <laughs> to the back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, being in the comic itself, if you were, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the term isekai into say your own comic book, would you survive? Uh, oof. I, I would, but I'll totally be the guy that like takes the last three pages of the book after everything is fun and done and just brood and be like, so this is what it has come to. All the dreams, all the regrets leads me to this, fade to black. So I'll I'll totally milk it. <laughs> I'll milk it, stick the landing. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I love it. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Oh, wow. Um, okay. I'm going to give a platitude and I'm going to give the real piece of advice because I think they're both valid. Uh, but the one that says never give up, that's a platitude, but it's true. Um, I think you are not guaranteed success at all, period, full stop, right? America is a land of opportunity, not promises. But you can't win if you're not playing in the game. And so if someone who does decide to keep forward, they buy themselves a ticket to that success lottery, they can do that. But truthfully, the one I think about the most, uh, and that's kind of been like my own personal motto, um, kind of a sidebar, we we're talking about this uh, before we went live. I'm a big baseball guy. And my second favorite baseball team is the Chicago White Sox, which is abysmal to watch this season. Yeah. But the, they had a, um, a charity uh, fundraiser where you can buy a brick at you uh, guaranteed rate now it's uh, old or new Comiskey. and my 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 motto is make your hometown proud now i'm from brooklyn new york famous city you may have heard of it barbara streisand's gone jay-z's gone but the fact that i said that makes you think of two different brooklyn's right if i was ever on tv for something or if i was ever meeting someone if i was ever in a place that no one had seen someone from brooklyn how can i live my life to make my hometown proud 
And I know Brooklyn doesn't care, but that can be applied to anyone, right? Like, hey, this person uh, is polite. He's kind. He adheres to customs. He tries to be helpful. He's a person that, like, reads a book. <laughs> he, he uses deodorant. Wow, he makes my hometown proud. So don't give up. That's a kind of a standard answer. But I always live my life and think of creative. So how do I make Brooklyn proud? Everyone usually has one person that inspires them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Tony Danza. Oh, do you want me to explain why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. No, oh, come on. Yes. <laughs> Tony Danza, man. It, and it's funny because he's also a Brooklyn Knight as well. But right. uh, I consider him one of my childhood heroes, but the one I ascribe to the most today. Uh, he's kind of the last renaissance man. And what I mean by that is everyone I feel like now, this is probably anecdotal, they do a lot of things. Uh, they have a lot of slashes, like I said, here in Los Angeles. But it takes a lot to be very good at those things. We always say we're a jack of all trades, master of none. But Tony, whether you want to think of him as an actor, maybe not the best actor, but he's devoted 35 years to it, or he's a boxer or teacher or ukulele player or jazz singer, which I have as both his albums. One of them is not even on digital anymore. He goes 100% into everything he does. Are things great? No. But to quote the rapper Eric Sermon, it may not be nothing, but I wrote this here. And I always appreciated that uh, as a kid, and I appreciate that growing up. Uh, I've always reached out to his people to see if I can interview him for my podcast. I've been turned down plenty of times, but I won't stop trying <laughs> because I do think it's pretty cool. Yeah, you, you got to go after those types of people as well, too. It's not not just for, for the cloud or whatever. It's just you want to have a genuine conversation. I think, uh, you know, if you can do that with whoever's on the show, whether they're famous or not, I think that's a, a testament to your professionalism and to your interest in the person itself. Absolutely. And besides, who's really like knocking down Tony Nance's door? Really? <laughs> Accept me. <laughs> Boy, who was yours? Can I ask? Who was, uh, is that like, weird to me asking no, that question? not at all. Uh, for me... I've been lucky to do a, a couple of press junkets here or there, especially in, at Fan Expo in Toronto. So I've been able to do like media circuits like that. Before Lost Girl got famous, the TV show about 10 years ago or so, I got to meet Anna Silk and Chris Holden Reed, um, who's been in a number of different series. And so there was only like 20 of us in their initial premiere of their first episode of the lost girl series like before it even aired and we just had a, a great one-on-one -on -one conversation and chat and so whenever i'd go to these these events it'd be like he'd, he'd see me in passing and he'd give me a wave or whatever and yeah. i tried to get him to work on a feature film i was putting together and we just we never kind of got that going but it's just just the, those types of interactions were amazing famous other famous people i i interviewed neil adams uh, obviously a very a talented artist for DC and Marvel wanted to interview Stan Lee, never got a chance. That was the main thing, uh, which is why I asked these last four introspective questions. Um, mm -hmm. But I've had a lot of comp people over the years, a couple of film people, but yeah, I just, I just love the stories. The stories is what drives me and what keeps me going. So it's always fun. Yeah. Uh, as a big Green Lantern guy, it's pretty cool to get there and talk to Neil Adams. It's awesome. Yeah. Lots, lots, lots of different people. I mean, you, you kind of lose track after a while. It's just like, okay, don't be flexing on me now, bro. <laughs> that's just how you know. No, that's just my short-term memory loss. That's all. That's that's not flexing. <laughs> that's just me being you know forgetful. But she... From a professional standpoint, you're of course a very talented comedian, baseball journalist, podcaster, and co-creator of an amazing series called First Place Losers. So professionally, you're successful in many different fields. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I didn't for a long time um, because if you're creative, there's that always the, the sense of doubt, the imposter syndrome. Uh, if you're someone like myself, who I was a son of, of scientists uh, or uh, engineers, uh, you always equate a uh, tangible number, in my case, my income to my self-worth. And sometimes you're kind of like, how can I be successful if I have to buy ramen for dinner? Uh, but I, I will say the fact that I've done it consistently enough and um, I was able to have a career, even though it is not the most stable sometimes, uh, to say I'm doing it creatively is successful. And not to say that if you have an office job, you're not. You could be amazing uh, and at a desk or amazing in a place, but I knew that wasn't for me. So I made the jump, I made the switch, I made the transition to be self-employed, uh, to work things that I love and that makes me uh, work uh, at my craft. This is talking to a microphone, this is me writing, this is me writing jokes. And I'm happy to say that I think on that level, I am successful for sure. But I will say that sometimes you work and you get those checks and they're not good. And you're like, oh no, I'm a failure. 
Look, as long as I can afford coffee, ramen, and, you know, my girlfriend hasn't left me yet, it's a good thing. Yeah, sometimes I'm a little close, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> two out of three, call me ramen or your girlfriend. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't take the cat, for the love of God. Yeah, I finally got attached to it. Right. Uh, <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, there is a book written by Douglas Neff, who considers himself the Tony Robin of nerds. And that is what he calls himself. I don't call him that. Uh, it's called Epic Win. I bought that book like three or four times. And he has a chapter about failure. And that is, you have to allow yourself to be bummed out, right? So I think of failure as like a mental injury. Like if you like pull a hamstring or you pull a quadriceps, it hurts in that moment. The next day it feels worse. And then after that, it should be starting to heal. And so I always give myself a day or two to be in the dumps. Uh, the, I just, there's no way I can't. And then some people will say, oh, no, put it down, keep moving. Yes, I'll do that. But I will cry and complain for about 12 to 36 hours after a big failure, mm -hmm. a rejection, or no one buys the book, or when my graphic novel got rejected by Comixology, which was the basically the linchpin of my business strategy for that book. I was, I took a weekend, I just drove out east from LA to Las Vegas, which is not nearly a good idea when you're upset, <laughs> but I did it because I needed to figure out what was next. Uh, but after that, you have to go, look, you're going to fail more times than you succeed. A lot of TED Talk says, don't be afraid to fail. And trust me, I hate when people say that because nobody wants to get smacked in the face. But the idea is that you're going to. like The odds of you being successful are so slim that you're going to miss, you're going to fall. Uh, hopefully the next time is when you hit that jackpot. And so, uh, yeah, so I take a day and a half for myself. I recollect, I try to say, what can I do? Is it worth a pivot or is it worth trying again? I think that's the most important conversation in failure. Is it worth doing it again the way you did it? Or is it worth changing your approach? And then you try again later on. So yeah, it's a constant thing. It's there all the time. What's the most recent literary pilgrimage you've gone on that we should read? Literary pilgrimage. That is, that is a good one. I, wow. Uh, so during the pandemic, I had my little Lobitos book club and I know it was a, kind of a years, years ago, but um, there was a, a book that's pretty much famous now uh, called the midnight library. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty interesting about the idea of the choices we make being represented uh, as the regrets we have in life being represented as like books and libraries when you pass on you have a chance to review the regrets and live your life and see if you did what you want to do so that stuck with me for years after that so it's about two years since i read the book and i'm like man imagine if i was in the military if i wanted to be in the air force when i was 16 or imagine if i followed my my parents path it became a civil engineer or my friend's path who worked at a trophy store in high school but he, he kept that job for 25 years where i decided to go to college and be the creative man you know what i mean uh i think that's the last time i think where a book really transcended my worldview and made me think about what i'm grateful for what i'm appreciative for uh that sort of thing but as far as like reading reading i'm actually reading the bible as literature my mom is a devout christian and uh not to say i want to get any christian points but the idea is that i want to be able to connect with her as she gets older like i can't talk to her about youtube views and stuff like that so i'm doing that but the ironically the actual pilgrimage <laughs> or the pilgrimage you're talking about wasn't from the bible it was from that book uh, the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or maybe they want to create something in the entertainment industry. Maybe you're inspiring them down that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Stop being creative, kid. No, I don't do that. <clears throat> we, need, we need creatives. Even though we talk about the struggle and depression and stuff like that, this is very important. I always say you take what you like and find out what inspires you, which sounds like a really cop-out answer. But I understand in art school, when you're going to painting, you do a whole year or two emulating other styles until you find your own. Uh, a lot of crafts uh, don't have that barrier, or that formal structure. I think use that to your advantage. If you're watching a TikTok ad or TikTok video, you go, uh, if you're positively inspired, like saying, oh man, this person's really cool. I want to be like them. Cool. Or if you're negatively inspired, like, oh, this guy, he's awful. I could do better than that. <laughs> um, then then try it. Uh, I became an author uh, by accident. 
Well, I was in film school and my film school was, was cut up in different disciplines. I was an editor, which means I'm the last step of the filmmaking process. But I saw so many scripts that were written by writing students. I go, ah, whatever. And they became my screenplays. And when they said they didn't have the time to make these into movies, they became short stories and novels. And so I do think for the next generation, it's important to figure out what inspires you, to you what inspires you both positively and negatively makes you go, okay, I now have the book to create. Will AI take our creativity away, especially this younger generation that really hasn't dived into the research aspect and to find out things for themselves? No. If you're talking about artificial intelligence, absolutely not. And I know it's kind of like, because I have I have artist friends that are just posting the ban AI thing, like I like the movie Chappie or District Nine, like ban AI, bro. And I don't and I don't want to advocate using AI in a place of actual craft, right? Like if you write an AI book, you can, but you don't say I'm an author if you plug it into you. That's not fair or something, but these are technologies. These are tools that could be applied later on. Um, a lot of my graphic designer friends, I have graphic designer friends. If I wanted to make a logo for my podcast, it was going to be everlasting. I will call them up and I'll go, hey man, uh, I have a logo. My One of my wrestling podcasts, it's uh, it's pro wrestling, so it's predetermined. I go, but I, we, we treat it as if wrestling is real on the show. Hey, I want like an ESPN type logo that that talks about like, you know, the the, 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 the seriousness of the show that's clearly a farce i paid out for that no problem mm -hmm. if i am putting that logo on a template for instagram so it doesn't get cropped off i'm going to use tools i'm going to use digital tools i'm just it's not taking anyone's work away it's not trying to to undermine everything um there's something you can find a way to work alongside it yes will people exploit that yes will people try to break any system absolutely but as long as there's been art there's been people willing to purchase and support that art art will be everlasting good stuff if your life was a comic book what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be Ooh. um Wow, what the title of my comic book? Is it a one shot? <laughs> Is it a graphic you. novel? <laughs> up, up to you, man. You're you're the creative. I was gonna say if it's like one of those like those three panel gag strips, it has to be like a rhyme, like hey, fate, fate, or <laughs> it is it is whatever you would like it to be. I I would say. Uh, the Lord of Flatlands. And what that means is there was a movie called The Lords of Flatbush uh, that was a source of loan, uh, and that's a neighborhood in Brooklyn. I'm from the neighborhood next to that, Flatlands. So I'll say The Lord of Flatlands. And nice. the soundtrack... Uh, I, you know, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I'd have been like, EDM, bro, because it was the 2010s mm -hmm. and EDM was everywhere, But because oh, yeah. I, I was trying to follow the trends. But I, it has to be a mixtape, man. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. Hip-hop was the, the, the music I grew up with, and my parents are from the Caribbean, so definitely uh, some reggae music and soca, and I'm a wedding DJ, so I kind of have a, an inkling of almost everything, even the cheese song. So I want this giant wedding mix <laughs> to, to be uh, the Lord of Flatlands' the soundtrack. Just because you're a baseball guy and and I'd be remiss if we didn't just touch on this. Is the game better because Angel Hernandez is finally gone? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, I would say yes, but he's gone. And so we're like, yeah, he's gone. So Hunter Wendell's dad, oh, you're dang. still around. <laughs> we just move it down the line to the next thing. Uh, yeah, I think I will actually, I missed the memes. I missed the memes. Yeah. But ultimately, yes. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I had to ask that just because I've, I've had other creators on who are baseball people. And it's just like, you know, baseball fans will always come together because of that one villain, no matter what, no matter what team, no matter if it's the Yankees or men or, or you know, the angels or whatever it is, Yeah, Detroit, especially getting screwed over as much as they have been over the decades, you know, because MLB never likes Detroit for some freaking reason. It's, oh it's, yeah. Oh, I had no oh, idea. I thought, I thought Magnum PI would get you so much goodwill. They, yeah. You know, you figure as much. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Flo, I do hate to say it. That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Just talking first place losers and life and creation. It's been a lot of fun. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is first place loser and anything else you'd like to promote? 
Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you check out the Kickstarter page, even though we are funded. That's where the one-stop shop for the resources and learn more about the book. First place losers into the Kickstarter machine. Uh, I myself, I'm on that X at Flobo Boys uh, on Instagram at Flobito. That's F-L-O-B-I-T-O uh, dot com. And if you want to know more about my writings, uh, I'm more of a sports comedy journalist. I have this blog. It's called Just the Sandwich dot com. Just the Sandwich dot com. Is here or read my takes on baseball, wrestling, Formula One, and more. Okay, favorite wrestler of all time or currently? All time. I was a big D'Lo Brown guy because okay. you know because I was I was a fat kid that was that was brown. But <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, it was the, the big three that you're gonna love this. The big three was uh, Razor Ramon, yep. Tatanka, and Duke the Dumpster Drozzy Band. Oh no, <laughs> that's always love that. Oh man, oh man, that's great. Well, I do hate to say it, but that is this particular episode of Two Kids Talking. You of course find this interview and 1200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. Look, website's going through a revamp. It's borked. I can't do anything about that. So go to our YouTube channel. That is always updated. YouTube.com forward slash tgtmedia. Like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff because what is my life for if not these particular interviews? And of course, our podcast is at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.